Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Rogers of the Arizona Library Association Professional Development Committee, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on show subtitles in your Zoom window if you would like closed captioning. And this session is being recorded. The recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Lauren Clementino will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. Membership. I would like to encourage, oh, webinar sponsorship. <laughs> oh, there we are. <laughs> Membership. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide these professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for additional information. And you can support AZLA when you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Arizona Smile Portal. I mean, Arizona, <laughs> Amazon Smile Portal. Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases made to the Arizona Library Association. And I will mention webinar sponsorships. AZLA professional development webinars do reach librarians and library professionals across Arizona and throughout the USA. So if you know a business or organization that would benefit from direct access to library professionals, please have them contact us at development at azla.org for sponsorship levels and rates. And as a part of our webinar series that we offer each month, I want to invite you to the next program in this series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On June 9th, join us for AZLA Diversity Committee Leading for the Future of Libraries with Catherine Lockmiller and Megan McGuire. This recently formed AZLA Diversity Committee will present their current projects, the 2021 Workforce Survey Responses and Future Impact for Libraries, and they will be discussing future goals for the committee. This panel will invite interactive feedback from attendees. So please attend this one and be a part of the future um, where we can make AZLA a more diverse workforce. Registration for this webinar is posted in the AZ or in the Arizona State Libraries events calendar, the AZLA calendar, and it will be advertised in the monthly professional development email blast and a link will be provided in your webinar follow up emails. And I would like to thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Corey Tuller, Janelle Breedfeld, Brittany Stiles and Linda McCleary for their presentation, Connecting with Community, Lessons from Arizona Genealogy Day. Thank you, Pam. Um, we are so glad to be here today. Welcome to everybody. Um, we are excited to talk about Arizona Genealogy Day. I'm going to share my screen, but turn off my video so I am not a distraction to the process here. Um, so let me pull that up. Is everybody able to see my screen? You can nod, I guess, the panelists that I can see on video. Perfect. Um, uh, we have a lot that we want to share today, so I am going to just get started. Um, here is a very broad strokes overview of what we're going to cover today. 
I'm going to speak to the process of making this type of program happen. Brittany and Janelle will talk about presenting information about resources, and Linda is going to give an overview of the partnership opportunities. So to start, I'm going to do a bit of a rewind um, and let you know about how Arizona Genealogy Day came to be. Um, our library signed a scanning partner agreement with FamilySearch in late 2018, early 2019. Um, and as a result of that partnership, I attended Roots Tech, um, which is a large family history conference. Um, and I attended in 2019, and I had heard that another Arizonan was going to be there, um, Kim Harrison. I believe at the time she was president of the Arizona Genealogical Advisory Board um, and also a leader in the West Valley Genealogical Society. So I had contacted her in advance. Um, it's always good to make sure you have a friend waiting for you there. Um, and we made plans to meet. She introduced me um, to a lot of people. We attended some of the same sessions together and we had some really um, productive um, lengthy conversations about how we could strengthen the relationship between the state library and the genealogy community in Arizona. So we stayed connected and she approached me in 2020 with the idea of Arizona Genealogy Day and the rest is history. <laughs> um, so we got started. We had a planning committee that we pulled together. Um, it consisted of Kim and Linda, who's joining us here today from ASGAB. And then I was on the planning committee as well as another member of our library staff. And so we had a lot of key decisions to make, a lot of plotting and planning to do. Um, so we started by trying to figure out when, when we wanted to hold this event. And this is where Kim and Linda came in um, with their expertise to help us make sure we weren't conflicting with any national or local genealogy events. We tried to find the right spot um, to maximize our potential attendance. Um, so their knowledge of that circuit was very valuable. We also um, needed to make a decision about whether to hold the programming in person or virtual. And since we were in um, you know, taking pandemic precautions, we decided for virtual um, last year and this year. Um, and realistically, we didn't have this type of space to be able to host an event for the size of audience that we hoped to attract. Um, so your options are going to vary um, with your library and your resources on whether you'd want to do virtual or in person, but that's definitely a decision to be made when you're talking about this kind of programming. And then, of course, budget um, is a big factor. We kind of bootstrapped it in 2021 because we didn't have much of a budget then, but we did have more of a budget for 2022. Um, so unless you're using your own staff, you're gonna to wanna to be aware that there are speaker fees um, and they vary by speaker. And if you are having an in-person event, don't forget to account for the added expenses, um, even for a person who might be joining you from in Arizona, you know, there might be travel, gas, lodging expenses and such. So if you choose to do a virtual event like we did, you're going to need to choose a platform and your resources may very well depend on what your library has available. Um, we used WebEx during our first year because that's what we had. And then this year we were able to use Zoom. Uh, there are a number of platforms available. Um, I am gonna assume that many of you have probably participated as an attendee on a variety of platforms over the last couple of years and likely have your favorites. Um, but uh, we ended up going with Zoom and then we really didn't have any tech issues with Zoom this year, which was exciting. We had some when we were using WebEx. I think Zoom is more familiar to people, um, but the audio and video ac access seemed quite seamless. People seem to be very familiar with the platform. Um, and we did make sure to do a tech check um, a few days prior to the event with the speakers to make sure they could do all the things that they would need to do. Um, we did make the decision to hold it as a Zoom webinar, uh, which is the same thing that's happening today for this event. Um, it was um, something that met our needs and ticked the boxes for us. Um, but decisions on exactly what platform you'd want to use if you have a choice um, are gonna depend on a few factors. And uh, some of those are what you want the audience to be able to do. For our purposes, we didn't want to have 
audience members, um, the attendees be able to unintentionally or intentionally <laughs> turn on their audio um, and disrupt in that way. Um, and we also didn't want their video to um, cause a distraction as well. Um, you also would wanna consider how you'd want to arrange the chat for your attendees. It was important to us that the people attending were able to engage with each other um, and talk to each other and to us to try and replace that part that was lost by having it virtual. Um, since genealogy conferences, it's really exciting to talk to other people about their research and the resources they know about. Um, you'll also wanna consider what kind of engagement uh, you'd want to, how you'd want to keep them engaged. Uh, we ran a downtime video um, that asked questions sporadically to help spark conversations in the chat. Um, and you'll also want to consider how you want questions to get to the speaker, whether it's going to be through the chat or through one of those special Q&A tools that platforms like Zoom have. Um, so lots of things to consider as you're able to make a choice, if you're able to make a choice. Um, for registration, uh, you probably have your own process for registration, or you might choose to use the direct registration options that come with each platform. We used LibCal um, since we had that available to us, but I also put the event on Eventbrite. It's a free listing. It brought some added attention to the event, um, which was valuable. And even though it took a little bit of extra labor to transfer people's information from Eventbrite to LibCal, um, it wasn't too much um, and it was worth it in my mind. Um, we did encourage people in the description on Eventbrite to go to the registration page on LibCal, but we know that saying something doesn't always mean that it's going to happen. So um, I would get a notification email and then I would just go ahead and manually put their name and email um, over into LibCal, which was important to us because that's how we were pushing out reminders and um, messages and a survey after the event and so on. Um, I am going to turn the time over to Linda for a moment so she can talk about finding speakers, which is a huge part of planning for this kind of event. So Linda. Sometimes finding speakers for your collaborative program is as close as your own staff. The staff members are knowledgeable in history, documentation and organization, and they can provide excellent programming ideas for you. Statewide speaker sources can be found on the Arizona Genealogical Advisory Board website under Speakers Bureau and with the Arizona Council of Professional Genealogists website under Members. Of course, the Arizona Research Library staff at the Arizona State Library is always happy to provide help and information. Corey? Thank you, Linda. Um, let me go back to where I can move the slide. Um, so uh, publicity, uh, it's an it's a important part of the whole process. Um, so here are the flyers that we uh, created for 2021 and 2022. Um, and here you can see the speakers that we chose for each event. Um, we were trying to find that right balance of broad topics and specific topics that could appeal to the diverse interests of Arizonans. Um, and we definitely encourage feedback from the attendees and from you um, for our future events. So please don't hold back. Let us know what you want to see. Um, but for our flyer, um, one of the things I wanted to point out is that we were hoping um, we didn't know last in 2021 whether the event would be successful, whether we'd be able to have it be an annual event, but we had high hopes. Um, so we were aiming to have a flyer that we could have consistent through the years. So we wanted consistent branding and imagery and font and, um, and style. Our administrator created the flyer for us in 2021. Um, and then I updated it for 2022. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, we'll follow that pattern. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, though, is the flyer was created on Canva, because um, we we're able to have a free account on Canva. And I'm, I can't speak to anybody else, just myself, but I don't have a natural eye for what looks good. Um, I just don't. <laughs> some people do. Uh, but Canva has free tutorials to help you learn about some key concepts in graphic design that help um, 
prepare content that looks good and meets accessibility requirements and and things like that. So I definitely would encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. And I'm sure there are lots of resources out there um, because there are a lot of people out, like me out there that can't do this without lots of help. Um, I will say though, make sure that when you're preparing your flyer that you have the necessary logos on there, especially if you're partnering with another um, group, we wanna make sure that everybody has the exposure that they need and deserve. Um, and also don't rely on only yourself for proofreading. Um, you really need all the eyeballs. You're not going to regret it. Um, one of the changes that we made to our 2022 flyer, thanks to Linda, um, was adding the time zone. Um, this was important for us because we knew that our virtual event had appeal outside of Arizona, and it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't register with us the first year, but definitely the second year, um, thanks to Linda. So we added the time zone. Uh, we still had people confused about what time zone Arizona is in, but that's a known thing that we tackled as questions came in. Um, but I appreciate Linda for helping make the flyer better in that way. Um, Things that are free are wonderful. Um, we tried to find as many um, free options for publicity as possible um, and take advantage of those. And here you can see a brief sampling of how we marketed our event. Um, and the handout has links and suggestions there. Uh, but I created a, propos a promotional video that I put onto YouTube. Uh, we, I wrote a press release that got distributed using our communications department from our agency. Um, conferencekeeper.org is um, a site that you definitely should know about because you can post um, in-person and virtual events there. And so it's um, a great resource of genealogy, um, things that are happening. Um, and there are so many other online event calendars, even in places you might not think of. Um, AARP has event calendars, Arizona Highways has an event calendar, radio stations have event calendars. Um, and of course we post it to social media as well. Uh, we also, as Gab and the library, had email lists and newsletters and the information got there too. And it really you know, helped to get the word out. Um, and the speakers as well helped and shared with their networks, which was really um, great to, get people to, to know that it's happening and sign up if they were free. Um, one thing I would recommend though, uh, because we were putting the information in so many different places, um, a real time saver was to have a Word document where you could just copy and paste from. And this might be super obvious to everyone, but I think it's um, it, it was helpful to be very strategic, like, okay, this is the information we want to post and we're just going to copy, paste, copy, paste. So we're not having to write things in new and exciting ways. Um, we're making sure we're getting all the information included um, and things like that. And it was, it was a real time saver. So I found that very helpful um, moving forward through the publicity phase of this process. Um, another task that uh, was for us, and you might want to consider as well, if you don't do something like this already for your program, was to have a downtime video that can play before, during, and after your event. Uh, we included um, information about our library resources. We included questions to prompt engagement in the chat, like I talked about. And then we included slides highlighting local resources. Um, and Linda's going to talk more about that later. But I put it in PowerPoint, I exported it as a video, I uploaded it to YouTube, and I added some copyright free background music and I just had it on repeat during the event. Um, and that's something that, you know, takes time and effort, but I think is, is helpful. Okay, so we've inched closer and closer to event day. Um, one of the things we wanted to make sure was that everyone knew what their role and responsibility was on event day. Um, just like Lauren and Pam today, you know, have a plan, they know who's doing what. Um, so we had uh, Kim, who was our host and moderator for the day. Uh, we had Linda, who was watching the chat and engaging with attendees, um, dropping links when needed. Um, your mileage might vary, but if your speakers allow you to record the event, uh, you'd want to designate someone to 
to remember to press start and stop at the right times, that would be important. Um, uh, if there's any technical issues, having somebody ready to help troubleshoot those is important. So just anticipate who needs to be doing what um, and have a plan. The biggest challenge for us this year um, turned out to be not audio or video issues, but because we were using Zoom webinar, um, it wasn't allowing our attendees to save the chat. And the chat was really valuable because people were sharing resources and comments and contact information. Um, and so that caused a fair amount of stress for people during um, the first session. Uh, but we figured out a way to tackle that because we could save the chat as hosts. Um, and so we promised to save it and send it out. Um, and so that was solved, but frustrating for people for sure. Um, Another um, challenge for us was that um, getting the handouts distributed. I had emailed them prior to the people that were registering, but we had people registering the day of as well, even in the middle of the event. Um, so we wanted to make sure they were available to the people that were there. Um, but again, Zoom webinar didn't work quite as we expected it to uh, because I had the option of dropping files into the chat. So I thought this was going to be easy for us. And for some reason, uh, nobody could see them. <laughs> so we had to pivot pretty quickly. And I put the handouts on the registration page um, just for that time that day. And then I took them down at the end of the day. And so then we just had to redirect people to that registration page to grab the handouts and download them. Um, which was, it worked, but, um, you know, the goal was to have dropped it in the chat and, you know, we just, we roll with what happens. We did the best we could. Um, so, um, another thing that I found helpful on event day was to have a stage management plan. Um, I like to check boxes. <laughs> so having a checklist that is very, you know, to the minute of, uh, who does what at what time and what it is they're going to be doing and this was this is just a sample of the the page or page and a half that was our was our cue sheet um and i um, had this by my side and i was checking boxes as we went down and it just helped keep us all on track and know who should be doing what um and uh i found it helpful you might find something similar helpful for you as well um, as I said earlier, um, I had worked with the speakers in advance to get permission to record um, and make the videos available according to some agreed upon parameters. It was really useful um, because some people who wanted to attend but couldn't because life happens, um, you know, would have an opportunity to view them. People who had attended but because there's so much information being shared, you know, and so much wisdom, um, rewatching one, two, or more times is is helpful. Um, so I'm really grateful for the speakers who allowed us to record. Um, there are a couple of sessions that we were able to record and put on our YouTube channel, but not public. Have it be a private listing, um, and just the registered attendees got that link, and they were able to go and rewatch um, for you know a two week period. Um, that was the decision that that was made. Um, a couple of the sessions we recorded and we were able to put on our YouTube publicly um, and indefinitely. And so if you didn't attend Genealogy Day this year uh, and are interested, you could go to our State of Arizona Research Library YouTube channel and look at our genealogy playlist and see uh, a couple of the sessions from this year's event, as well as some other content we have from previous events. Um, so if you missed out, you're welcome to go take a look. Another takeaway that we wanted attendees to have um, included access to a LibGuide. Uh, we were able to get a LibGuide about the resources in our research library collections, as well as in the Arizona State Archives collections, um, put up and ready to be viewed uh, just before event day. So that was exciting that we made that timeline. Um, it contains resources that were talked about in the government documents session that Brittany and Janelle uh, provided, but also about all of the other resources we have to offer. And I think that, um, you know, as information is being shared, being able to say, okay, and you can look at this 
as you're able or look at this as you're able, you know, was helpful. So, um, so we worked hard to get that up as well. And then we sent a survey post event because we wanted feedback. We wanted to know what people thought. So we included the standard questions um, from IMLS that you see here and that you may have used yourself in surveys. And I just pulled one um, example from question number one, I learned something by participating in this library activity. And you can see that over 80% of people strongly agreed that that statement was true. Um, and the rest agreed. And uh, that was all very positive feedback and that held for the other questions as well. And so that's really um, um, a statement about the quality of our presenters um, and uh, the information that they were able to share and how well received it was. So that, that made us very happy. Um, in addition to those questions, uh, we also included questions that would help us assess our marketing effectiveness. How did you hear about this event? Um, we wanted to see how far our reach was um, in Arizona and beyond. And so we asked people how far they virtually traveled, um, not wanting all the details, just city and state. <laughs> um, we wanted to build a list of possible future topics and speakers. And so, um, you know, opened up free form, you know, tell us what you want to hear about, tell us, you know, a great speaker that would um, fit what we're trying to do here. Um, and we also gave people an opportunity to sign up for a mailing list so that they don't miss news of these types of events in the future. Um, and spoiler, <laughs> uh, you're going to get some of these same questions in your post event survey today, thanks to um, AZLA Professional Development Committee. So, not everybody completed the survey, but we did have a good turnout and it did tick up a bit from the last year, but we had 232 people uh, return the surveys. Uh, some came right away within the first few days and then they kind of trickled in um, for, for a, cup, a couple of weeks. Um, but 232 is holding. I think that's the number we're gonna land at. Um, <coughs> excuse me, um, but we got it good information about our reach. So I wanted to um, show you a heat map um, that uh, is kind of interesting to see. And we know that this isn't comprehensive because not everybody completed the survey. So I'm thinking our reach is, is beyond you know, what, what we see, but we can call this an international event because we had people in Australia joining us, which is pretty exciting. And then if we zoom in even more, um, mm -hmm. you can see that we have quite a few states um, um, that joined us that day. Um, and I'm going to zoom in even more to show you our reach in Arizona. Um, we, we clearly have some gaps in Arizona. We need, we need to get some people from Flagstaff to, <laughs> to join us next time. But this gives us some information that will help us do some targeted outreach to make sure we're pulling um, from all parts and making sure um, residents and public libraries all over Arizona um, and genealogical societies know, know what we have to offer and hopefully might want to join us. Um, so then I'm going to zoom in even a little bit more to see just Metro Phoenix area. And you can see how, you know, we had people from, you know, as west as Buckeye and as east as, um, I guess that's probably Apache Junction. Um, and so my big takeaway from seeing these maps um, and knowing that they're just a portion of the attendees, so they're likely more, um, that a virtual Arizona Genealogy Day um, is, is a wise choice. We were able to share information with a wide range of people um, who likely never would have been able to show up um, to an in-person event. Many of them wouldn't have been able to. Um, we can't ignore that some people aren't able to attend a virtual event. event. The digital divide is real and that's an issue that needs to be tackled. Um, but I think for future Arizona genealogy events, it would be um, important to have it not be just an in-person event. Um, I think that would create a barrier. So trying to figure out those details is definitely on our, our to-do list for, for potential future events. Um, okay, so how did we do overall? Um, the, uh, you can see here that um, 
We had increased views this year for sure on our registration page. Uh, the pattern was a little bit different. I thought it was interesting that in 2021, when we were, um, this was very new for us, we had kind of a slow build, uh, which makes sense. Um, but in 2022, you can see that we had, when our registration page went live in February, it was almost like instant, very steady numbers for us, um, steady impact. The event itself was on April 2nd. So having 748 views on by April 2nd um, was kind of surprising, but not so much when you think about how I had to put the handouts there and we had to send people there. So it makes a little bit more sense why that number is high in April, even though the event took place so early. Um, but I think that the repeat event helped us a lot. And I also think that, you know, we had some um, speakers that had a lot of national networks um, and we were able to get the word spread. And so um, our speakers really um, from last year and this year helped us bring um, awareness of our event. And so we definitely appreciate that. Um, for uh, registrations and attendance, we did have more people register this year than last, and we had more people attend, um, which was a great, great leap for us. We were very happy with those numbers. And then you can see the breakdown um, session by session, and we did have an increase across all of those. Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out about these numbers. One is uh, we surely had people that came for one or two sessions um, during the day. And that was great. It was a come, come and go as you were. It was one link for the whole day. Um, but we had a significant number of people and I don't have the number off the top of my head and I apologize, but it was, I think, uh, I'd hate to say a wrong number, but um, nearing 200 or maybe just over, we had people that stayed with us the whole day. Even though some of the sessions might not have been directly relevant to them, they stuck with us and they, after the fact, said, hey, I really learned something, even though I didn't think I was going to get anything from that session. Um, and again, that um, is a statement about our speakers and what the quality of the content they were sharing, as well as their presentation styles and the applicability to many needs, um, not just the topic they were talking about. It was, it was translatable um, to other needs. So that was exciting um, that we had that increase. The lunchtime number, though, is a bit fuzzy because uh, a lot of people probably just stayed connected to us and walked away, which was fine. They probably ate lunch um, or went to get lunch and bring it back. But some people did stay connected with us. We provided content during the lunchtime hour. Uh, we had a brief video presentation from the Arizona Historical Society about their resources, and we re-ran a session from last year's genealogy, genealogy day. Excuse me. Um, so uh, yeah, so we were, we were very happy with how things turned out. Um, I will say though that the attendee numbers, like the reach, how many people did we really get to, um, varies the, from the numbers that you just saw for a couple of reasons. And one, um, this is something I discovered when I was going out to see where our information was shared and marketed. And I saw that um, one of the public libraries here in Arizona um, advertised a watch party. If people didn't have Zoom, they could come to the library for a watch party. And I haven't reached out to them to say, hey, how did that go? Um, but I will, and because I'm, I'm interested to see, but I think that that's a really, um, really brilliant idea. Um, that can be another example of how public libraries in Arizona could piggyback on this programming um, and bring patrons into their library. Um, the other, metric that isn't that needed to be added is the people that went and watched or re-watched the videos um, to kind of track what our reach really was. So I've talked a lot and I don't want to talk anymore. I want to give a chance for everybody else, but um, I included a nice cold snowy image for us since we are in Arizona. Um, but um, we talked a lot about the process just now and the handout will have a lot of hopefully helpful links. Um, and if you need additional information, um, you know, please reach out. But I am now going to turn the time over to uh, Brittany and um, Janelle for their portion where they'll talk about the presentation. So um, Brittany, it's all yours. Okay. I'm going to turn off my... Can you guys hear me? Okay. I'm going to turn off my video for this part. 
All right, you can move on to the next slide, Corey. Okay, so regarding preparation for the presentation, um, the biggest lesson I learned was not to stress and realize I can lean on previous ideas and content to create my own presentation. I know that may sound obvious, but when you're nervous to present something new and that's even new to you, remembering you don't have to reinvent the wheel can be really cathartic. <laughs> so, because the topic of genealogy was a new research topic to me. But through reaching out to my um, fellow colleagues who presented on genealogy before, I was able to have a foundation of where to start in creating my own presentation. I really could not find any content to use from other libraries, yet I was able to find um, an interesting webinar on how to promote government documents in my community. And um, I, which I thought was helpful, which I thought was helpful, because while it was not geared towards genealogy, it was nice to get um, ideas on how to present um, um, government documents to your local community. So with that stated, I recommend to those who are interested in doing a workshop or training on genealogy resources to search for content that is similar to what you're interested in presenting on. This may look like finding out if your library has done presentations or programming or genealogy on, on genealogy before. Also, I, if your library is part of a network of other libraries, reach out to all the other libraries within the consortium and to see if there has been presentations ever done on this topic before. And if you're having challenge and if you're having a challenging time finding content to get inspiration, um, just reaching out to a colleague, um, they may have some ideas on where to start. So next slide, please. And that leads me to why the knowledge of colleagues is so crucial in creating a presentation. I was so fortunate to have colleagues that were there for me during the process of preparing content for my presentation. Um, to provide it their own PowerPoints they used to present as a reference for me to, to use that um, had links and resources that I could use for my own presentation. Another colleague actually found out I was presenting and they like were excited to tell me about the state government documents that they found in our collection that they were using for their own family genealogy research, which I thought was pretty cool. So it's important for those who are presenting this type of material that is new to them to know that you are not alone and to lean on the insight of colleagues and fellow presenters. Um, Janelle and I really worked together on our presentation and the collaboration helped give me the confidence I needed to present. I also learned so much about how government documents can be beneficial um, uh, to genealogy from my colleagues. Next slide, next slide please. I was super excited to learn um, what um, state government documents had to offer to a researcher's genealogy needs. So I decided to do my own research through my library's catalog. And since I was new to this type of research, putting myself in the user's shoes was super easy. As all librarians and paraprofessionals know, it is always good to do a pre preliminary search to understand what the researcher will experience when, when searching your library catalog. And if there are other resources that are being presented, it's, it's, it might be a good idea to also do searches within that other resource to get a better understanding of how to navigate through those resources as well. And when I was doing my own, um, just like searching for state documents within my catalog, I found some really cool um, resources that weren't provided to me previously that I was able to use um, to present on. And also it was helpful to do my own research. Um, and so when we had questions after the presentation, I could be like, oh yes, I found this, or oh no, I'm not sure if we have that. You know, I had the confidence based on my own research. Okay, now I'm going to hand it over to Janelle who'll provide more information on how to prepare for the presentation. Great, thank you, Brittany, for sharing your lessons learned. Um, so once you complete the research phrase that Brittany was already describing, the next step is to actually plan the presentation. And these are some of the steps that Brittany and I found to be helpful that you should keep in mind. So first, as Corey mentioned earlier, deciding if the presentation is virtual or in person. Are you hoping to have attendees participate from around the state, across the country? Are your in-person programs usually really well attended? Uh, next, think about if you want to present the material yourself, 
if you want to do a joint presentation, or if you want to bring in a guest speaker. And finally, it's important to think about how you want to structure the presentation. You could give a lecture and share a PowerPoint. You can do a live demonstration of resources by searching different websites. You can play video clips, and you can also have a question and answer session. Uh, in some cases, maybe you can do a combination of those different activities. So specifically for our presentation at Arizona Genealogy Day, the program was already going to be virtual. So thankfully, Brittany and I didn't need to make that decision. And we were both covering uh, using government documents for genealogy research. So it made the most sense for us to give a joint presentation. And then we could each focus on our area of expertise. So Brittany focused on state publications and I focused on federal documents. And we really wanted to make sure that our content uh, was consistent, that our program was smooth. So we opted to give a joint lecture where we had one PowerPoint slide deck that we divided into sections for our different topics. And then at the end, we also had time for Q&A, um, which was actually very robust and active. We had quite a few questions. So um, that was the approach that worked best for us. But there may be a different approach that works well for your audience. Next slide. Uh, so once you've planned your presentation structure, it's time to pick the genealogy resources you want to share. So from that research phase that Brittany covered, uh, there are a few uh, key resources that we recommend thinking about including. So first, look at local resources that are at your library. Do you have genealogy books, special collections? Maybe you have government documents, newspapers, telephone directories. All of those are useful resources for genealogy research. Next, we recommend thinking about some national resources that attendees can access from anywhere. Those are things like Ancestry.com, especially if your library has a subscription, FamilySearch.org. Uh, you can also share the National Archives and Records Administration website or a website like GovInfo.gov, which is the official platform for federal documents. And finally, while you have a captive audience, don't forget to highlight your library's other collections. If folks are being introduced to your library for the first time, this is a really great way to introduce them to other resources that are available, even if they aren't related to genealogy. So for our presentation at Arizona Genealogy Day, uh, we had a national, excuse me, an international audience like Corey recommended. So we focused on government resources that are unique to our library, but we specifically highlighted some of the digitized collections that are available online that attendees from around the world in places like Australia could access. Uh, we also highlighted national websites for genealogy research, and then we highlighted collections and services that our library offers. Next slide. All right, so you have structured your presentation, uh, you've tailored your content. Don't forget to create that supplemental resource handout. So what do you want attendees to remember? Think about the list of books or resources that are available from your library, links to those national resources we talked about, uh, like the Archives and Records Administration. Uh, also, if you've created instructional videos or libguides, you should include those links. Uh, also, other information about your library um, and contact information for questions. So in this example on the slide, you can see a screenshot of our handout for our presentation. And at the top there, we have our general links that cover our library's homepage, um, catalog. Uh, we also have links for our federal documents resources and state publication resources. So overall, um, we really hope some of these lessons learned from our presentation at Arizona Genealogy Day will be helpful for you as you start planning your own presentation. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it off to Linda. I'm going to piggyback on what my colleagues have already said. You need to check your local resources. Many genealogical societies already utilize the meeting rooms in the libraries. So you probably already have a contact uh, list and, and information for that. ASGAB does have a listing of local genealogies on its, um, on its website under societies. There's also resources in your handout that you can check. And then um, we also encourage you to submit a few slides regarding your resources at your library, including your logo for the 2023 Arizona Genealogy Day. It's a great way to advertise your resources and your staff, and it's free. Here are some examples of slides that were submitted for the 2022 Geneal Arizona Genealogy Day. 
and the types of information highlighted. So you may want to get your thinking caps on now and start planning for next year. Okay, Corey. Thanks, Linda. I'm afraid we've shortchanged you a bit since we're getting close to time, but thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I'm, you may already subscribe to the Library Services and Archives newsletter that comes out and may have noticed that there was a call for content um, earlier this year uh, so that you could submit those resource slides that Linda just talked about. Um, we are, um, if you're interested in doing that um, for Arizona Genealogy Day 2023, um, be sure to watch for those announcements, or when you complete the survey, um, you can submit your name, and I'd be happy to give you a personal invitation when I'm ready to receive that content, um, and uh, would be happy to, to set you up for that. But um, we want to extend our thank you to the Arizona Library Association Professional Development Committee, um, and thank you to all of you for having to joining us today. Um, and if you want to stay connected, if you want to give suggestions, um, again, through the survey or emailing me directly, uh, we would be happy to, to hear your thoughts and um, have you be part of this. And I will turn the time back over to Pam, I think, to see if there are any questions that came in and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you all so much. This is incredibly valuable and I think an area of high interest um, across Arizona. The first question, can you expand a little bit about 2023? Um, are you changing up a bit of a mix and, and do you have some, um, and, you know, will it be part virtu virtual and in-person? Like give us a sense of, of what libraries can expect and plan for. Um, sure. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Um, the, so we have not started planning for 2023 yet, although we've had such a successful 2021 and 2022. Um, I think it would be, um, you know, we're on a path that we want to continue being on. We don't have our budget information for next year, which will surely impact some of the deci decisions we make. Um, so I think the best way to um, know what to expect is to hold on a little bit longer so we can get our details in place so we know what we can offer. I think virtual was really valuable. Um, I don't want to dismiss the people who can't participate virtually. And I know that there is a core segment that prefer in-person events. Um, so those are conversations that we'll have with the planning committee and happy to take comments if people want to email me and, and let me know their opinions about that. And we can incorporate all of that as we make a decision of what it's going to look like moving forward. We we do have limited space. So um, in-person event for the size that this would be would be hard for us. We'd have to kind of get creative and and come up with a plan if we were to pivot to that. But I think, um, you know, we're still in a lot of an uncertain world. <laughs> so we uh, want to make sure we're doing things that protect people as well. So that was a non-answer, but hopefully it it's enough for now. <laughs> Well, and if anybody has any thoughts or comments right now, please put them in the chat. The, uh, you have an active uh, <laughs> uh, audience here to, to let your voice be heard. Um, another question that came in, and, and Brittany, I really loved how you explained how you took your approach to like kind of really um, taking on the view of a user using the research library. But somebody asked about out of state access. Was that a problem for those participating from out of state? Um, did you encounter any barriers uh, when you did some of that testing and, and or any other issues when talking about an array of documents for people to look to? Were there issues of folks um, gaining access? When I was doing my research, I honestly did a lot of Googling. So <laughs> I didn't like um, struggle to find Brittany. like, Oh, pretty. Can you, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Can you pull down your, your microphone? Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Oh, my God. Sorry. I just started talking without even thinking about it. Okay. Um, I didn't find any barriers. Um, wait, okay. Let me take that back. To In regards to accessing things, I... Um, you know, I use a lot of because my I my researching was state Arizona state documents, so a lot of it was locally in my um, my catalog. I didn't really find, I guess, you know, just in regards to barriers um, in regard outside of mine things. It was just finding helpful content 
about state documents and genealogy. It, you know, there's that's a unique relationship, you know? And so I think that was just like, you know, I did a lot of Googling, like state docs and genealogy, you know? And I didn't really find a lot. I did um, use um, one of the, um, you, and I should, I mean, I can find a link. I didn't even think about this, but um, what was helpful that where I found um, that webinar was um, Godart has um, uh, a YouTube channel for help I am a government documents librarian and uh, some of their webinars um, I watched and I believe one of them was, you know, how to do, gov like I said, government documents on um, um, sharing it with your community. But it, it was, I think that was the only barrier I found was just trying to find things, st connecting state government documents to genealogy. That was a unique thing because I really didn't find a lot connecting those two or relating those two items. Um, I hope that answered the question, though. Um, I'll just speak really quickly for yeah. Fed docs. Thanks, Brittany. Yes. So on the federal document side, again, because we had an international audience, I was really trying to highlight federal documents that have been digitized and are available online, uh, either through us, through our platform called the Arizona Memory Project, where we had a lot of scanned materials. And that's also where Brittany has a lot of the scanned uh, state publications or um, federal documents that have been digitized and posted on other platforms like govinfo.gov, which I mentioned. Um, or another site called Hottie Trust. So I think we were really trying to promote as many resources as possible that may be digitized and can be accessed anywhere, just so it wasn't something um, that folks only have to come see us in person to use. So that was the goal in our case. Thanks, Janelle. <laughs> well, and yeah. I'll just, oh, can I pipe in as well? Just to yeah. say, um, you know, uh, Linda and I and Kim and the planning committee you know, are very aware that people interested in Arizona genealogy do not just live in Arizona. Um, and so the push to try and make resources available online is important. Um, and then some people, you know, take special field trips to Arizona, hopefully not in the summer to, uh, although the prices <laughs> be lower, um, be, uh, to, to access our materials in person for the things that we can't put online, but it's, it's definitely a balance trying to make things as accessible as possible, so. Great, that's really helpful. And thanks for the additional resources um, and, and those mentions. Um, this question, uh, Linda, you touched on it, um, but could you expand a little bit and describe the, the relationship with other genealogical societies and sort of uh, what that looks like even throughout the year? You know, is there, is there additional contact, you know, and sort of how do you um, uh, work with them and, and how does that enrich your programming then? Well, as I said, a lot of genealogical societies already uh, access the, uh, the, the local public library. So uh, there's already a, a relationship there and uh, genealogists will use the public library resources, whether it's online databases or whatever. And surprisingly, the genealogical societies are uh, in con connection, in communication with each other, and they rely on, on each other for help and assistance. Um, I know here in Phoenix, the West Valley Genealogical Society and the Family History Society work close together um, so that they don't have the same uh, national speaker for their for their conferences, and then they also make sure that uh, that they have a separate date for their their annual conferences, so that there's uh, you know so that people don't have to choose one over the other because it's a money making project, and genealogical societies do do need them the money and the resources. So I, I see a, a close relationship between public libraries and, and genealogical societies. Uh, I know a few years ago, the Southeastern Regional Library in Gilbert uh, held a free genealogy fair. And uh, I, I think there were 500 people that came and the genealogical societies uh, were there to help, help sponsor it too, as well as the friends of the, the library. So there, there is a history of collaboration and, and working with genealogical societies. Thank you. Um, it's neat just to hear the, the that, it, that the relationship goes both ways, really, you know, that there's support for them, their support for us. 
Um, and can one of you talk a bit about, um, do you ever share anecdotes that sort of come out of the research of those who learn about how to use the, the, the information, the databases, their research then that, that um, reveals stories that kind of touch our lives and, and change kind of how we see our societies. Do you, any of you have any anecdotes to share from, from uh, your sessions? I mean, we definitely get a lot of feedback about how valuable um, people found the sessions and how it sparks them to spend time doing research that um, sometimes in, uh, th there are a wide range of people who work on genealogy um, and have a lot of great stories to share. And I'm, you know, I think we all who have done that could rattle off lots of stories, but in terms of people using our information and sparks, um, you know, aha moments and things that they didn't think about before and things that they pursue. Um, we don't always have like the circle back, um, although from the survey results, we definitely um, begin to, you know, see the the gratitude and the value, and it's almost like we're launching them, but we don't necessarily get to see them fly. Um, but sometimes they do come back because, you know, we do have a lot of repeat patrons um, that, uh, you know, come back genealogy day to genealogy day or resource to resource. So um, I know that this past genealogy day um, we had a um, presentation um, from Mark Lowe, um, who I believe is with us today too as a supporter, um, and he was um, talking about migration patterns to the southwest and shared a lot of really interesting um, maps and resources and people, um, you know, learned a lot and definitely had a lot of things to pursue for their own personal research after learning about things such as the stagecoach maps and um, things like that and things in government documents. So um, that's me rattling off an answer. Does anybody else want to pipe in? I, I feel like there are a lot of stories to tell. I just don't know if I'm the best one to tell them. Maybe that's an idea for us to promote for future genealogy days, invite people to, you know, where did you go from here? Tell us more. Mark says they've been sending them all to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will so say, have to share his stories with us. <laughs> well, and just the words stagecoach map just captures your imagination. So <laughs> that's that's just kind of wild to think about. It puts you at a, a, a point in time and mm -hmm. that, that's, that's just really neat. Um, yeah, Janelle, you were going to say? Uh, I was just going to say, again, nothing specific, but I think in general, what Brittany and I heard a lot right after the presentation and what we hear uh, consistently in our jobs is just one, people don't often realize government documents is even a specific area. They may have never heard of it before. And then when we share just the examples of the richness of the information that's available and how far back it goes. Um, so we usually get a lot of wow, aha moments. I had no idea that this even existed. So it's always fun for me to um, be able to share with someone a publication that they've never heard of before. And I do hope, as Corey said, we've launched them off to fly and hopefully they'll use it again in the future. For sure, for sure. Um, any last, we have just a couple minutes left, any last minute thoughts or anything that, that popped into your mind that you would like to, to share with the librarians on today and, and others and anybody who's dialing in? Um, I'll just say that I'm, I'm, I've really enjoyed working on this program and I really hope that it's um, scalable to local um, programming as well for public libraries. Um, but even if it's not, because I know that some people, you know, limited resources, limited staff, um, you know, I hope that they can explore relationships um, in, with the local genealogical societies and, and come up with some programming ideas. And at the very least, um, you know, reach out and, and try to piggyback on our programming. Um, let us help amplify the local resources that you have um for the audience that we get for our programming and um you know reach out to me and we can figure out ways to work well together because we appreciate all that the public libraries do and all that the genealogical societies do throughout arizona and um uh, 
am happy to to hear more about what their needs are and how we can how we can be helpful. Any Wonderful. other? Oh, okay. any, anything else? I was going to ask if anybody else had anything to pop in there, but I think that's perfectly said, Corey. Yeah, you're always so <laughs> eloquent, Corey. Thank you. <laughs> the collaboration is so important in these times where limited funds are. Uh, yeah. Public libraries and genealogical societies, it's a good hand in hand uh, grouping and it's worked in the past and it'll continue to work. Together we are stronger. What a final, uh, great final thoughts to end on. So thank you all for being with us today. You will receive an email with a link to this recording and all the wonderful information that has been shared. So thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.